This is Really Famous. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson and I interview famous people, but I don't just interview them like your typical interview. I'm not really interested in those same old questions. Instead, I like to know who they really are and what they really think. Today I'm talking to Ken Levine. Ken is an Emmy award-winning writer. He's also a director and producer. He has written many episodes from some of your favorite shows like Cheers and Frasier, Wings, MASH, The Simpsons. And on today's show, we really break it all down. We talk about a lot of the shows he worked on and a lot of the people, very famous people, who he worked with, like Mary Tyler Moore, Ted Danson, Tom Hanks. A few other things that Ken is known for, he was a major league baseball announcer and he's a podcaster. He has a podcast called Hollywood and Levine where he gives the inside scoop on writing for television. Ken lives in LA, but when he was in New York producing a play, we got together and had this conversation. Yeah. You and I met when I was in LA. Right. A few months ago. It was Thursday night, and there's like a thing, right? You gather on a Thursday night. Yeah, it's really sad. There's like a bunch of us former radio people in Los Angeles, and we get together every Thursday night and uh, and drink and, and talk about the old days. And I mean, it's really a cry for help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was invited by Carson Beck, who is also there regularly, I guess, when he said, you got to come with all the old timers to have some drinks. Yeah, you get uh, you to you get to mention uh, call letters and, uh, you know, your favorite station growing up and that sort of thing. And we all pay tribute to Robert W. Morgan and Dan Ingram and the real Don Steele and great disc jockeys from the past. Like I said, it's uh, it's pretty pathetic. Well, I have to tell you, I felt pathetic <laughs> myself. I was like very self-aware of the fact that you guys all have these voices that uh, are really me. good. Yeah, except me. All these other guys have, hi, how are you? You know, and I'm like Minnie Mouse there. <laughs> They all have these amazing voices, and then when you when they're talking normally, like they still have those voices. Yeah, no, those people are just blessed that they open their mouths and this beautiful sound comes out. Right, and then Carson showed me a few videos. Like I don't remember all their names, but I know that somebody did a lot of tra- or does a lot of trailers, like movie trailers. Yeah, and he was showing me some of them on the phone, and they were like yeah. so impressive. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are really great gigs if you can get them. Yeah. 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 In a world. You know, those guys. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So you can do that too. <laughs> Hire me. Well, someone said, <laughs> and someone said to me, I think it must have been, you must have left and I was still there. And someone said, do you realize who you were just talking to? I said, yeah, Ken. We, I just met him. We, we were talking about our podcast and whatnot. He's like, yeah, he's an Emmy Award winner from Cheers. He wrote for Cheers. So it was pretty impressive. And you probably went, that schmuck? Really? <laughs> So I said, oh him, my God, him. that's major. <laughs> Cheers is a big deal. Yeah, you know, I'm very proud of my association with Cheers. Uh, I worked with a writing partner and together we were on the show for nine years and we wrote 40 episodes and I never got tired of writing Cheers. I never got tired of writing for those characters. It was just a wonderful experience. Yeah, very cool. And I think one of the first podcasts, so you have a podcast and it's I have a podcast, called Hollywood and Levine. Hollywood and Levine. And that's very clever. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Did you. Do you think of it? Yes. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> You've had fun factoids on your podcast too. I'm just going to sell your podcast a little bit. Oh, thank you. So Go let, ahead. let's start with the one that cracked me up. You told the story about Mary Tyler Moore. Uh huh. <laughs> you want to repeat that story here? But sure. Um, my partner and I created a series for her in 1985. One of the many Mary Tyler Moore failed series. And wait, she had a lot of failed <clears throat> series. Oh, yeah, she had a lot of failed series. After the Mary Tyler Moore show, she had an ill-fated variety show that was really terrible, and then they kind of redeveloped that, and the new version was terrible, and then there was our show, which is not terrible, um, but put in a bad time slot, and then, like, two more failed attempts at shows. Yeah. Um, But anyway, when she was working on ours... My wife and I had her over the house for dinner one night. So wait, can I back up a second? Okay. So is that normal that, so you were a writer or a creator or what? We were the writer, creator, producers of that show, So is that like typical that you would have one of the actors over to your house for dinner? Um, Yes and no. Uh, Mary at the time was living in New York and 
her husband, who is a cardiologist, was in New York. So we knew she was alone, you know, in a rented house in Bel Air. And we thought, you know, let's invite her over for dinner. And I should back up even further to say that I was a huge fan of the Dick Van Dyke show. And I had this major crush on Laura Petrie, who of course was played by the young Mary Tyler Moore. So now Laura Petrie is having dinner at my house and I'm sitting in the living room with her. My wife is off in the kitchen preparing hors d'oeuvres and the wine. And the conversation between Mary and I turns to the Dick Van Dyke show. And at one point she says, uh, yeah, you know, we had separate beds in that show, you know, because of the censors and everything. And I said, yeah. And she said, when am I supposed to fuck Rob? <laughs> <laughs> and hearing Laura Petri say that <laughs> in my own living room was surreal. That's bizarre. Yeah, so it was she would just come out moments. and say whatever she was thinking then? Is that, yeah. that the kind of person she was? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you don't think of you don't think of Mary Tyler Moore saying fuck, and you certainly don't think of Laura Petrie saying fuck. Right. Although I have heard some stories about Mary Tyler Moore, though, that she wasn't exactly Laura Petrie. No, she was more the uh, the character she played in Ordinary People, actually. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. So she was in Ordinary People. God, it's been so long since I saw that. But she was a very... Um, was she an alcoholic? She was a very cold, cold, uptight type of person. So she was cold and uptight. Yes. <laughs> yes. I well, yeah. I heard a little story about her, like, yeah, being cold and I guess uptight. I don't think uptight would have been the description for this, but that's so interesting and it's so bizarre that, um, you know, she's like uh, Mary Tyler Moore. Yeah. Exactly. Did you work on the Mary Tyler Moore show too? No, did not work on the Mary Tyler Moore show. I worked in that company in MTM, uh, the first staff job my partner and I got was on the Tony Randall show, which was done by MTM. Tell us about Tony Randall. Oh, Tony Randall was great. I really loved Tony Randall. Um, for your listeners who are not familiar with Tony Randall, Hey, he, do you think there are listeners not familiar with Tony Randall? Yes. All right, yes. Tony Randall was part of the Odd Couple. Yes. He and was he Felix, Felix Unger. Yep. And he was very fastidious. Uh, he memorized everybody's lines. He knew the entire script. Uh, super professional. And the, the really cool thing about Tony Randall is that at the time I was working on the show, I was single. So I would bring girls to come to the filming. Oh, they must have loved that. You know? That is so cool. Yeah. So after the show, I would always bring my date down to the stage and go backstage and meet the cast and that sort of thing. And I would always introduce them to Tony. Tony would always go, oh, we couldn't do the show without Ken. He's so funny. He's really terrific. So you know, so glad that, that you're with Ken. I mean, he was a great wingman. You should have taken him out to the bars and whatnot after. <laughs> yeah. The thing I also think about him, I have to say, is that he had a baby when he was like 70, right? His oh, wife no, had a baby he was or... like 80. Was he 80? Oh my God, yeah. He was like 111 yeah, he when, he, when he had really a baby. Old. Yeah, so... his wife of many years, who, who I knew when we were working on the show, she used to call him the star. That's the only way she would refer to him. The you star. Know, the stars in his dressing room, that, that kind of thing. So is anyway, he like a star-ish? Is that why? Kind of, you know. So she passes away and he's like now 75 or something. And he marries like a 22-year-old. Yes. And <laughs> he's 81 or so and, and has a kid by, by her. Right. Um, so, yeah. So who else is on that show? There was nobody really notable. They were like really good actors like Rachel Roberts and uh, Alan Ann McCleary, uh, Barney Martin, a lot of actors who had worked on Broadway, uh, Zane Lasky. Was it a New York-based show? 
No, it was an oh. L.A. based show. Kenny you Pizer got a lot of the, was on that show. A lot of the Broadway actors sometimes when you get that, yeah. it's in New York, but nothing was filmed in New York back then. No, right? no. really, it was all L.A. Yeah, it was all L.A. What was weird is I later I directed a sitcom that Nathan Lane starred in. Talk about yeah, talk broad, about Broadway. Talk about Broadway. And in that cast was Glenn Headley and uh, Joan Plowright. Joan Plowright was this famous, esteemed British actress. At one time, she was married to Laurence Olivier. And, you know, I'm giving her comedy cred. notes, right. okay? That's Joan, weird. honey, here's how you make this funny. So did that feel <laughs> weird to you, like, when yes. you did things like that? Yes, yes, it, right? it, it did. It did. Yeah, but you never got, you got used to it at a certain point, I would think. Yeah, yeah. What, well, here's, here's how I got used to it. And this was thanks to a friend of mine. I was directing a show that had Malcolm McDowell in it. And I was a little nervous about that. And I was saying to my friend, who's also a writer, God, I'm directing Malcolm McDowell. This is a guy who starred in Clockwork Orange for Stanley Kubrick. My friend looked at me and said, he also starred in Caligula. That's good. Yeah, he's just a regular guy. Yeah, okay. It turns out he was great. He was easy to work with. Yeah. That, it can that type be, though. I would think that especially because you've been, I mean, you've worked with so many big people, but I would think that a lot of times when you're going to a set or something and you actually have to direct especially because that would seem to me like that's most nerve-wracking, but I don't know. You know, like, it, it, what's a little tough in television is that you have no time. <laughs> You know, I direct a lot of multi-camera shows, which are the shows that are filmed live in front of a studio audience. So you have four cameras going and the actors are basically performing like a one-act play in front of an audience. Frasier, Cheers, Seinfeld, Friends, those are all shows that are multi-camera shows. And when you have a play, you have time for the actors to sit around the table and we call it table work and go through the scripts and the motivations and what do they mean here and how do we make this moment work and television you got to get it on its feet right and have it blocked and ready to go in like three hours because the writers are going to come down for a run through so it's kind of guerrilla directing and what helps is when you're doing a show with a cast like, say, Frasier, where they all know their characters. So you're yeah, you not, really you're, have to like get you're to not helping the David Hyde Pierce find out just who Niles is. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. I miss that show. You know, oh, I miss that show terribly. I loved that, that show. That was so good. And like, who would think that you could just take Frasier out of Cheers and add Niles and his dad? What was his dad's name his again? His dad was John Mahoney, who yep. passed away. He's very sad. He's a lovely, lovely guy. Everyone in that cast so good. Was, was so good. Jane Leaves, Perry Gilpin. Everybody. Wait, and also, you, weren't there a lot of like a lot of famous voices that would do that would be called yes. into the radio show? Yes, the uh, casting director. I don't know exactly who thought of this originally, but you might remember in the show that Frazier's job was a radio talk show host. So we needed psychologist people to call in, you know, Dr. Crane, I have a headache and I'm a bedwetter. What do I do? That kind of thing. So we would just get somebody to do it for the audience when we filmed it. But then they would go and find celebrities and just record them, you know, and you could record them over the phone because that's the way in. they were they right. were doing it anyway. So it meant five minutes of the celebrity's time. You would send them their lines and call at a certain time and just record them them doing it. And so I can honestly say, and not many people have this distinction, I can honestly say that I wrote comedy for Dr. Timothy Leary. <laughs> That's pretty good, Ken. <laughs> yeah, he was one of the uh, the people on one of my shows. And Kevin Bacon. 
Wait, so, so if you ever play Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, I always you can just go find me and you're right there. I'm one degree of Kevin Bacon. You're one degree of Kevin Bacon. So that's pretty good. Are you seven degrees then? It, would you be, would it be seven degrees of Ken Levine? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So you can play that instead of yeah. Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. But uh, yeah, and Art Garfunkel did one of ours and Wait, so they, I believe Linda Hamilton. Did you know who you were writing for? for no, those I have bits? no idea. So you you're just, just write you're it, just writing. an actor would do it, and then later on the whole show would get edited and you'd see for yourself like, oh cool, who, oh, who's yeah, calling? Oh yeah, who's doing me? Oh, what? Dr. Timothy Leary? So did Great. that become a thing like yes. that actors wanted to be part of? That I don't know, but I imagine... Because why else I, I would imagine, they do it? I'm, I'm sure there is a list of actors who passed, but we got a lot of interesting, fun people, and it was just a, a nice little perk. If I remember correctly, it was like the, be- the first scene, the opening scene, right, where he would be accepting a call from somebody usually? It depends Maybe on the not? show. Okay. It depends on the show, but more often than not, yes, it and then would you wouldn't, start. It wouldn't be, you wouldn't see the celebrity's name until the end credits. Right. And like it would be and like, oh my God, be- that was so-and-so, it, I never would have guessed. It kind of became fun to try to guess who that was yeah. in the same way that uh, the great caricaturist Al Hirschfeld, who used to do caricatures for the New York Times, would always write his daughter's name, Nina, in hidden, camouflaged in the drawing. And he would right. do it four or five times. And it was always fun when you saw a new Hirschfeld to kind of go through it and find the Ninas. Yeah, or... Hitchcock did the same thing in his films. He yeah, got well, he was into always, but you every, could always spot him. He was him. pretty easy to spot. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but uh, it's like with the voices, you. I don't think I would recognize most of them, or you'd be like, "Oh, it seems so familiar." But who is that? It's like a couple of weeks ago, my son was watching a movie. You know, it was an animated film. I forget which one it was, and I'm listening to the voice. It was the main character, and I'm like, "Who is that?" Like, it sounds so familiar, but I cannot guess whose voice this is. It was John Travolta. Oh, okay. And it was so weird. I was like, wh- who even knew that John Travolta did like Had a, a voice? big animated yeah. film? I, he's not <laughs> usually one of the voices. Uh huh. I think he was the main character. I want to say maybe it was Bolt or something like that. <laughs> but it's weird when you know you know the, the voice, but you can't place it. Well, that. we wrote a couple of episodes of The Simpsons, and I did a voice in one of them. It was the Dance and Homer episode. And it was the one where Homer became a mascot for his minor league team. And I'm also a baseball announcer, which is probably another whole thread we could get off on. But I did the voice of the uh, Springfield Isotopes. And it was so weird to record that. Like in May, we had the recording session. Everybody has music stands. And, you know, I'm standing with Dan Castellano and Harry Shear and Julie Kavner and Yardley Smith and everybody from The Simpsons. And we record this show. And then I don't see it again until it's on the air, animated and all done. And now it's like November and I'm hearing my voice coming out of a cartoon character's mouth. That was weird. Is that weird? That was weird. Like very surreal? Yes, that was very surreal. And you're used to hearing your own voice, or at least now you are, but you were then, I guess, because you were an announcer, right? Yeah, so it I'm, wasn't something strange to, for I'm you. I'm used to hearing my voice. I'm used to hearing my voice on the radio. But not coming but, out but of an animated. But not coming out of a cartoon character. <laughs> That on, is weird. On The Simpsons, yeah. So what What was that like? So everybody stands in, you know, I had Joe Montaigne on the show and he's uh-huh. been on a bunch of The Simpsons too. Right. He plays like a recurring character. And that was one of the things I was curious about with him. Like, what is that even like to record The Simpsons? And of course he said, like, there are all these crazy talented voice actors who were there week after week, like the people you mentioned. Right. And, you know, doing a table read and all that. So you tell me from your perspective, what... All right, so you were already writing for The Simpsons at that yes, point? Yes, that was our episode that I was in. Uh, the Simpsons, at least then, I don't know if they still do it, but I imagine they do. They recorded the whole show at one time, and everybody was in the same room. Like I said, we all stood in a big circle, and we all had mega, uh, music stands in front of us. And there was a director, Sam Simon, in the other room, in the control room. And he would 
give directions and we would record the show. So now, you would hear him in, yes, headphones. in your headphones. Mm-hmm. And uh, other shows, Family Guy, from what I understand, records everybody separately. And partly that's because Seth McFarland does a lot of the voices himself, but working through other people's schedules, that sort of thing, uh, each person records their their track separately at a separate time. And somebody may live in New York. Place, right? Yeah, right. So but somebody. But you can't work off each other that way, though, right? I know. That's kind of hard. I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would imagine that is harder that way. Right. And yeah. so the Simpsons. All right. So let's get back to the Simpsons. So you were already writing for them. So obviously you wrote that episode. And yes. I know I remember once you posted on Instagram or something, a picture of the credits from the Simpsons. Uh-huh. And there's Ken Levine in the middle. And it's yeah. pretty cool to see that. I'm yeah. sure. Well, that was the credit. That was my acting credit. Oh, that was your acting yeah. credit? Yeah. Yes. Which is the only acting credit I've gotten. Well, I have I've did cameos in two other shows that are long since gone and will never be seen again uh open all night and the marshall chronicles wait open all night sounds i feel like a little familiar what was that open all night was a show that was done in like 1980 and it was about a 7-eleven you know an all night convenience stand and the writer creators were tom patchett and jay tarsus who did the Bob Newhart show and also the Tony Randall show and they did they did this and we wrote a couple of episodes for them and we were in one episode and every year you submit scripts to the Writers Guild to try to get a Writers Guild award we've been very fortunate we've won a couple and the only thing that we had that year because it was a strike year and we were uh, on a development deal with Lorimar. So the only episodic television that we had written was Open All Night. So we entered one of our Open All Nights. A couple months go by, and I'm talking to my agent, and she says, oh, the nominations are out for the Writers Guild Award. Congratulations. And, and I thought she's joking. I, I, yeah, I said, oh, that's great. Yeah, we're, we're really happy. And then... The next morning, the paper came, and I said, oh, I wonder who was really nominated. (laughs) And it was like, holy shit, it was us. Well, by the time we were nominated, the show had been long since canceled, and it was a small production company that disbanded. So normally, if you're nominated for an award, and you're doing a show at Paramount, Paramount pays for your tickets, and Paramount will often send a car for you, that sort of thing. Well. Nothing? No, we had to pay for our own tickets. Oh, okay, that's no good. We had to pay for our own tickets. And we go, there's no open all night table. (laughs) We're the only ones representing open all night. So they put us at the Hill Street Blues table. Oh, cool. Okay. That's a good table to be at. It was a really cool table to be at. And this was early in the run. And that's when they had great writers and they were winning awards left and right so they all knew each other you know for eight people Stephen Botchko and his wife and David Milch and all the Hill Street Blues people and David and I and and our wives and they go well we're nominated (laughs) they go well for what we said uh best comedy oh what show open all night and they're all like what (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what's that <laughs> what's that that is so cool yeah. that's a great that's a great position to be in yeah. even though they didn't pay for you and give you your own table that's right did you win no we lost Who we lost won? That. uh i don't know so do you always write you, what you say on your podcast ahead of time are you a writer no, you no. don't so you just that's, talk that's, off the top i i will make kind of notes on points that i want to bring up but otherwise, no, I just turn on the mic and start talking. So and hopefully I'm semi-articulate. Right. Okay. I think you're pretty articulate, especially since you're not scripting yourself. But when I announced baseball, um, I did play-by-play for the Baltimore Orioles, Seattle Mariners, and San Diego Padres. And I would picture that I was talking to a woman in her 30s, 
because if you're a hardcore baseball fan, you're going to listen to the guy no matter what he says, okay? And you know everything, you know? But what about the casual fan? What about the fan who isn't into analytics and doesn't really understand all of the chess moves that are being done on the field, okay? You want to appeal to them and you want to be able to describe what's going on and sort of be a tour guide. And then I I also feel that with a woman, that a woman responds to emotions and that a woman responds to the players as people, not just bobbleheads. And so I try to really humanize the game and humanize the players and try to make make the game feel like you're you're following a story you're following a story right, and so you're making these, a story even out of these the, the are the baseball players. exactly these are the characters okay so you said that you announced for the uh the seattle mariners and the baltimore orioles right and san diego padres and san diego padres so those are all, all uh geographically distant so do you go to these places? Yes. So you yeah. would fly in for the games? Well, or what I would do uh, in Baltimore and Seattle is I took a place there for the season because you're doing 162 games plus spring training. So this is your not, where is this in your life then where you were, were you writing for TV yes. at the same time? Yeah, I was writing for Cheers at the time. So you could have a Cheers full season on Cheers and Frasier, and then that would end. It would be like summer hiatus or something. Pretty oh, much, it was yeah. Perfectly I timed. mean, it it worked out great because right. the TV season ended in March. That's when spring training began. TV season began like in August, end of August. So I would miss a couple of months. I'd be writing shows on the road, but then in October. I would be back, and fortunately, I was on teams that all sucked, so I never had to worry about those pesky things like playoffs and World Series. Right, that's yeah. good. That worked yeah. out nicely for you. Right, it's good yeah. Thing you chose those yeah. teams, or they you know, chose when you, you. When you lose ninety nine games a year, <laughs> you know you're going to be back home October second. Nice. Yeah. So, how did you get those gigs? Were they? Was it? How did that happen? Well. I always wanted to be a baseball announcer from the time I was eight years old and I heard Vin Scully. But um, I moved off into other directions. I got into Top 40 Radio and then became a TV comedy writer. And I reached my mid-30s and I thought, you know what, if I don't pursue it now, I never will. So I took a tape recorder and I went to the upper deck of Dodger Stadium every night for about two years and just recorded games and just practiced and learned how to do baseball play-by-play. And after a couple of years, I said to my saintly wife, well, wouldn't it be fun to spend a summer in some bucolic place? Sure. She said, "Uh, yeah, okay. And so I gave her a list of all of the minor league teams. There's something like 120 minor league teams. I gave her the list and I said, you check off only the places that you would like to go and those are the only places I will send my tape. So she checked off like 20. So I got three offers. I got uh, Vero Beach, Florida and Eugene, Oregon. Eugene, Oregon was a short season and the Syracuse Chiefs, which was AAA, that's one level below the majors. And you actually fly in airplanes and not 20 hour bus rides. So I took that and I was in Syracuse for a year. I got an offer to go to Tidewater, which was the Mets AAA farm club at the time. So we had a place on the beach and it was like a summer resort. So did a couple of years of the Tidewater Tides and there was an opening for the Baltimore Orioles and I had given my tape 
to John Miller, who I had bumped into at Anaheim Stadium after the minor league season, just to critique it. So I'm in the Cheers writing room, and it's a couple months later, and there's a call for me, John Miller. I'm like, John Miller? <laughs> oh, that John Miller. And I get on the phone and say, hi, Ken. This guy's got the world's greatest voice. Well, he loved my tape and said, there's an opening. I should call the program director of WBAL and throw my hat in the ring. So I did. I called him, and he said, yes, I'm familiar with you. Send me, which I thought was really cool, because I sent like a 15-minute, very exciting inning, home run calls and all that stuff. He says, send me three innings where nothing happens. Ah, oh, that's really the test okay. I guess. yeah. Send me three innings where it's just balls and strikes and ground outs. I just want to see how... How you fill the time. And I fool around on the radio. I do a lot of humor and, you know, I have a good time. You know, I was not a former player, so I don't have that to bring to it. All I have really is personality. And I sent the tape, and long story short, I got the job. I nice. beat out like 95 people. Wow. So, And you were selling yourself. So like you didn't have an agent or anything like that who was no, like knocking on no, doors for you. No, no. All right, can we jump back to TV for a second? Sure. Because you mentioned Whatever, somebody. It's your podcast, whatever you want to talk Ken. about. So you mentioned another name that interested me, Bob Newhart. Okay. So were you involved on the Bob Newhart show? I was not involved with that Bob Newhart show, but I consulted on a, a later Bob Newhart show called George and Leo that he did at Paramount with Judd Hirsch. I love Bob Newhart. Is he good? Oh my God, I love Bob Newhart. He has a podcast now, by the way. Does he really? Yes, oh, I believe I'm, he started a podcast. I'm subscribing it. He's the nicest guy. He's very funny. I remember one time when we were all exchanging Christmas gifts and he had lines for everybody and I mean just off the top of his head and wait what do you mean timing. he had lines for everybody he kind of had jokes about you or jokes about you that that kind of thing as he as he gave you know a gift um, but impeccable timing you know you talk about the secret of comedy ask me the secret of comedy ask what's the secret timing. of comedy Mm, <laughs> right, very good. So it's timing. Yeah, and he had it. He has so many actors say timing. that drama is so much easier than comedy. Oh, absolutely. Those who've done both, they almost all say the same thing. Absolutely. But I also feel like with some actors who are good in, I don't see that many who are really good in comedy that even go over into drama, which is supposedly easier. But sometimes when they do, it's really amazing. Like Steve Carell, for example. How funny is he in The Office? So funny, like crazy, right? But then he goes and does a serious movie like uh, Little Miss Sunshine or something. He's so good at that. I think actors like to be taken seriously. Comic actors like to be taken seriously. Because the truth is, and it's unfair, but people look down at comedy. You know, and so they want to be considered serious actors. So they all, you know, Bill Murray and Steve Martin and Robin Williams and Jim Carrey, and they they all eventually want to do their dramatic turn. All right, let's discuss this. All right, so let's talk about the ones that you mentioned. Bill Murray. So what? Give me a drama. I'm like not even thinking of drama he was in. He was in some. Somerset Mom movie, and he did that. Oh, like he, that Lost uh, in Translation? F FDR, and then he did Lost in Translation. He was very good in Lost in Translation, actually. I did actually. not like that movie. I'm one of the only people I know who didn't like that movie. I, I didn't love that movie, but I loved him. I thought I thought he was was very good in that movie. And, of course, Robin, Robin did Williams. Good Will Hunting. He was and, so good in that. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, he was great in that. One of my favorite movies of all time is Mrs. Doubtfire, though. Yeah, well, I mean, it's good comedy. So good, so yeah. good. Who else did you mention? I mentioned Jim Carrey, who Jim Carrey. I don't think is funny and I don't think is a good dramatic actor. So probably not so a good one to discuss. So neither, you would say. Yeah, I, I'm just you don't not, think he's good at comedy? I'm not on the Jim Carrey train, no. 
at Jim, all. Jim Carrey to me is so over the top and so in love with himself that it just it just oozes, you know, how much he's in love with himself does not make me laugh. That is so interesting. And so his he was in let's see, thinking of the dramas, uh, Eternal. What was that? Eternal, Eternal sunshine, sunshine of, of the Spotless Mind or something yeah. like that. The um, Truman Show. The Truman he did. Show. I like that movie. But you think every comedic? Do you say comedic or comic actor? Comedic. Either. What's depends. The diff? It depends on what side of the Mississippi you are. Which is which? It's comic actor on the on uh, East Coast. East Coast. All right. So you think all comic actors want to be taken seriously. Most do, But can't yes. they be taken seriously for how funny they are? I mean, that's what Robin Williams was known for. Right. And taken so seriously and respected so much by so many people because of his comedy. Right. I think the problem is that comics sometimes fall into a rut where they do the same act over and over again and it works for a while and after a while the audience gets tired of it and i'll give you an example will ferrell so what about him so i think actors will try to break out of that box a little bit and show that they're not just one trick ponies and that they can do different things so i asked ed asner who has worked with a lot of people to tell me who in all of his time acting, was the best actor who he's ever worked with. And he said, Will Ferrell. What? From Elf. They worked together on Elf. Right. He said, Will Ferrell. Was the greatest actor he's ever worked with? That is what he said. Go back and listen to episode number whatever, really famous, Ed Asner. I gotta hit him the next time I see him. Because Ed Asner's worked with a lot of great people. Who would you think he would have said? I would have thought maybe like a Gene Hackman or somebody like that. <laughs> I wouldn't say Will Ferrell. <laughs> However, Will Ferrell in Elf is so funny. That, seriously? Yes, he is funny in that movie. In that capacity, you're saying. In that movie. In that movie. So you're saying it's the same shtick over and over? Yeah. Get, give me some other movies that you're saying it's the same as. I can't think of them. What else is he in? Oh, he's an anchorman and uh, there's like 15 Will Ferrell movies. And I don't remember the titles because I've stopped going to them. I feel like I didn't. And I used to love. And I used to love Will Ferrell. When Will Ferrell was on Saturday Night Live, I used to love Will Ferrell. And the thing I loved most about him was how he really committed to characters. And I think he was funny. It's just you kind of get tired of the same shtick. I mean, I wonder. You know, my generation, we thought Steve Martin was hilarious. And I still do. I, I'm a huge admirer of Steve Martin. But you listen back to a Steve Martin comedy album. And when he's going, excuse me, and stuff. And the audience is going crazy. Okay. Play that album for a millennial who doesn't know who Steve Martin is. And they'll go... What are they laughing at? What is this? Yeah, I think I agree with that. And I'm going to tell you why. So first of all, I just watched Father of the Bride with my kids the other night. Okay. Which I love that movie. I loved it when it first came out. And I still love it. It's a great movie. I think he's so funny in it. Diane Keaton is good. I like the whole thing. What I love most about that movie is the two kids are Matt and Annie. And my two kids are Matt and Annie. Are they really? Yeah. So good movie. He's so good in it. And we were talking about him, and he has that thing with Martin Short or something now, I think. Like, yeah, I want to say special, a Netflix special. On Netflix, special or it's something. very funny. Is I it re- funny? Yeah, it is funny. I recommend it. Yeah. Mm, that's funny because I had said, I think my husband had brought it up, and I said something like, oh, yeah, I just don't think it really plays today. Like, I saw a little bit of it, maybe I'm, on another show. I'm not, I'm not a millennial. <laughs> right, right. I'm not a millennial. On the other hand, uh, I think the most brilliant stand-up today is John Mulaney, who's he's very young. His specials on Netflix are spectacular. I mean, like every line is just finely tuned and great, great material. He delivers it brilliantly. 
and he's a great young comic. So it's not like, well, the only comics that right. make me laugh are Billy Crystal because, right. you know, these guys who are my age. No. Wait, back up. Can I, we just back up a second because I still have Steve Martin on the brain, though. Okay. Because he also, we also recently watched Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Uh -huh, great movie. So good. Great movie. That movie holds up. And I'm telling you, because you're talking about different generations, my kids and me, like we're all laughing at Steve Martin here and we're all laughing at John Candy and Steve Martin even in The Pink Panther Funny, 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 funny. So maybe the stand-up, like the routine, is not of today's humor or whatever. Right. But still, I Which think it's so Which is understandable. Funny. Yeah. Because okay. times change. I mean, each generation Different finds things speak to them. It's, its person. And it's why, you know, when you get these young talk show hosts, like David Letterman and Conan O'Brien, people like that, who, Are you calling David Letterman young? No, I'm saying when, oh, when, but he, when he started, yeah, yeah. he was very young and he was very avant-garde and he spoke to a young generation and he aged. And it's like the act just doesn't translate. And I'm seeing that now with, with Conan O'Brien where, you know, Conan O'Brien was kind of the new kid on the block and was a little more irreverent and that sort of thing. And millennials, as they should, they have their own, you know, they, yeah. they have their, their, you know, John Who Oliver, they have? Oh, John they have John Oliver. And they, John Oliver. they have their Samantha B and they have their own people. You know, Conan is an old guy. Well, them. Conan, I think he just revamped his show, so now it's a half an hour. I don't watch any of those like late night shows personally. I feel like I don't they either. are the opposite of what I get into, which I get into like very real deep things. I don't like things that are rehearsed and fake and like just for entertainment. But I did just read that he's going to a half an hour format. And I have another thing about Conan O'Brien personally, which is when I first moved back to New York after college, I tried to get a job and I went into interview in the accounting department to be the assistant accountant at the uh -huh. Conan O'Brien show. And it was probably like brand new. Right. And I thought I killed the interview. I was like, oh, I'm so gonna get this. Didn't even get a call back. Oh, man. He's actually a very nice guy. I knew Conan I never when he was a writer on The Simpsons. Ah. So wait, he's how long very, did you write on very, The Simpsons? I just wrote a, a few episodes so early on So he was writing at the, at the same time as you? Yeah. And tell me about him. Very nice guy, very smart, uh, loves an audience, but um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of Conan personally. I think he's really a good guy, very stand-up guy, and I think he got jobbed with The Tonight Show. That whole, that yeah, was a fiasco for everyone, I think. That whole thing was a giant right? fiasco, yeah. For everyone involved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So who are some of your favorite people that you've worked with over the years? I would have to say Tom Hanks, Ted Danson, Shelley Long, Kelsey Grammer, David Hyde Pierce, Nancy Travis. Uh, oh, Nancy Travis is on that new show. Have you watched it? The Comiskey yes. thing? Yes, she's great. I love Nancy Travis. She starred in a, a show that my partner and I and Robin Schiff created in the mid 90s called Almost Perfect. It was on CBS for two years. And episodes are on YouTube, by the way. Oh, nice. Uh, blacklisted, but. Uh, Why? You know, well, you know, we put them up and we don't necessarily have you the, put the them right. Up? Yes, I put them up. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. So, what yeah. is that about? Why did you put them up and why? What is the issue with them? Because you don't own the rights to them? Right. I don't own the rights to them. Paramount does. <laughs> but you have them? Yeah, I have copies of the shows, and, and I, I put them up so people can see them. They're not you know? anywhere else? No, Why? no. They're, it's a 20-year-old show. It went into syndication for a while, and for whatever reason, it's not on Netflix. It's on Netflix in Europe, but it's not on Netflix here. So I put a couple of episodes up on Netflix. What is your Netflix. YouTube channel? What? What's your YouTube channel so I don't, people can well, find it? Uh, I don't really have uh, like a whole big channel deal. Um, but what, but where did you put them? Like where can people find, they just, they I guess, just go, Google go, or YouTube just search? Just say, you know, Nancy Travis, Almost Perfect. And while and you're boom, on, up 
they will come. While you're on YouTube, you can also go to Really Famous because I have a legit channel. I don't have Almost Perfect on there, but I do have little video clips. Um, okay, so it's up there though. You can Google it or, yeah, 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 or YouTube yeah. search you can go and, and you'll watch. find and it and watch it. It's a really good show. I'm really proud Let's of Let's talk about the Kaminsky uh, effect. Is that okay. what it's called? Kaminsky. I think that's it, maybe. I think method. So. Method. Method, Something yeah. Something like that. I don't know, a bunch of Jews. What's, what are your thoughts? What? Well, it's really fun because Lisa Edelstein is on that show, plays uh, Alan Arkin's daughter, and she was also on Almost Perfect. So it's kind of like an Almost Perfect reunion, in a sense. Alan Arkin is so cool, too. Oh he, God, to me, is one of the greatest. Oh. I'm dying to get him on the podcast. I feel like he would be a really be interesting great. person to talk to. I just remembered somebody else who you had mentioned in... Some on the show, I guess, uh, Thomas Hayden Church. This was Wings. Yes, yes. So you directed Wings. I directed Wings. That was my very first directing assignment. Which, can we just jump in for a second about Wings? Okay. So I had Tim Daly on the podcast okay. twice. Love him. He's great. Love Wings, him. come on. And I think Wings did way better when it was like, what was it, in syndication or something on USA than it did when it was actually going again. When it was on NBC. It was on it, NBC, right, everybody, Cheers got all the kudos exactly. or whatever. And Wings was this really underappreciated show. That's what Tim And said. then when USA started, they're looking for content and they bought Wings and they were playing Wings like eight times a day. And at the time, everyone at Wings thought, this is gonna kill us. This is just gonna kill our first run shows because people are gonna be so fucking sick of watching Wings that they're not gonna watch the first run. And it was the opposite. Right. It was the opposite, that it people discovered the show on USA and kind of got caught up. I mean, in the way we now go to Netflix and just binge watch a show that you discovered. Right, I and just it really discovered them. Yeah. Yes, I discovered, well, I didn't discover it. I, I watched it because I had an interview coming up with an actor on the show, but I started watching Jane the Virgin uh -huh. on Netflix, right. which is currently a CW show. Right. So there I was binging the whole thing, but now I'm dying for the next season to come out on the CW, uh -huh. but I was never watching it then. Uh -huh. So right, it helps. That's the way I am with Killing Eve. Oh, Killing Eve. Oh, yeah. All right, let's talk about that one. So, okay. what do you mean? You love it? I love it. Where did that air? I forget. It aired, I believe, on uh, Hulu. I, don't I want think to say. So. Well, it originally was on BBC America. That's it. But, you see, here's with so many shows out there and so much product, I don't watch anything because. There's so much, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole watching a lot of mediocre shows. And now, when you can access any show anytime, I just wait for people to say, oh, you got to see this show. This show's really great. And then I jump on the train, and then I can watch the whole thing. And that's and fine. That's that it, works. Exactly. But I don't think there's... there's Sure, there's mediocre TV, but there's a lot of good stuff out there too. Oh, of course. Right, but you're but, just waiting for other saying, people to find I'm it for I'm saying you. I don't want to sift through all this stuff. So like Killing Eve, I had heard really good things. So I like, okay, I'll try Killing Eve and loved it and binged watched it and can't wait for April. Another show that I love and I have to watch it in real time is uh, Better Call Saul. That one, I'm not going to wait for the season and then binge watch it at one time. I got to watch, watch it every week. You are going to watch that currently. Yeah, like, I got to watch it every same. week. Same. I will watch that one every week, too. And I've yeah. had a bunch of Better Call Saul actors on the show, too. Oh, cool. I had, first, I had Michael McKean, who plays Love Michael Chuck. McKean. He's right. amazing. Right. Um, then I had Ray Seahorn, who plays Kim Wexler. Get out. Yeah. And then I had... Can Patrick I have your address book? Yeah, hello. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool, am I right? Yeah. Then I had Patrick Fabian, who plays Howard Hamlin. So I've had all three on the show, and it has been so cool that, first of all, they're all amazing in real life, but also, how cool is it to sit there and uh, analyze Better Call Saul with them? Right. So cool. Right. Um, so you and everyone else who has not, if you haven't heard those episodes, right. 
I get Perry Gilpin. That's pretty good. That is pretty on good my, on my podcast. But I don't, I don't get these people. But Perry Gilpin played uh, on Frasier. She played. Uh, what was her? She was Roz. Roz. Mm-hmm. That's right. And Ted Danson, good guy. Great guy. Like totally good guy all around. Great right. Great guy. The Just best. what you the think. The best. And yeah. same with Tom Hanks. Yeah. And who else did you mention? Um, what about Kelsey Grammer? You said he's one of the best actors you've worked with. Yes. How is he as a human being? He's really nice. He's he's really a good guy. And so talented that it's it's almost effortless to the point where you go, oh, this guy is just at half speed. But he's not. <laughs> he's not. And I remember Harriet Harris who is an actress, was at Juilliard with Kelsey and said Kelsey was great and they ended up kicking him out because they thought, well, he's not working hard. But he didn't need to work hard. Uh, you know, he did the scene and he was but great. What do you mean? What wasn't he doing then? What were they complaining about? What was showing or what was... They just felt that he was, was kind of sloughing off. Did he care or something? Did he have an attitude of not caring? No, I... I don't know. I, again, I'm hearing this secondhand. Right. But the point is that whereas we all had to like work so hard to find the moments and find this, you know, that Kelsey, it just came easy to him. Mm-hmm. So super really, talented and a super, good guy. Super, super talented. And just very, very good guy. Uh, I mean, here's what a good guy he is when you think about it. So he gets the show Frasier and they cast this... David Hyde Pierce guy as his brother. And clearly David Hyde Pierce is the breakout star of that show. Kelsey was thrilled for him. Kelsey was as supportive as he possibly could be. Compare that to Sybil. Okay, the Sybil Shepherd show and Christine Baranski, Baranski was in it. Yes, she's and Christine so good. Christine Baranski won an Emmy, and then Sybil Shepherd made her life a living hell what? for How? the rest of the time. How, what did she do? She would take her lines away. She would act horribly to her. That's but, awful. But Kelsey Grammer, that's how generous an actor he was. And, and we never, ever ever had Kelsey come into the room and say, why are you giving him all this great stuff? Mm-hmm. Why don't you give me those lines? Why are we doing another Niles story? The show's called Frasier. Never, mm-hmm. ever did we get that That's from, awesome. from Kelsey Grammer. And also, but Kelsey, it's not like David Hyde Pierce would come on and like make everybody else in the scene disappear. It wasn't like right, that. Right. Kelsey would still be right. very... Amazing as Frasier sure. in those scenes. Sure. You know what I did? I was thinking Sybil Shepherd's funny you say that. I knew nothing about her and I thought she's somebody who uh, I should try to get on the horrible podcast. Horrible human being. <laughs> so, horrible, really? Oh God. Well obviously by horrible, what you're saying. Horrible, horrible human being. The writers on her show just so despised her. Terrible. But how, why be like that? I don't even understand. I guess just some people are like that. I totally agree. So but she was I, I, to everyone? I believe that money and fame just makes you more of what you are. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So if you're already a nice person, then mm-hmm. you become more of that? Yep. Yep. And if you're an asshole, then you have money and some fame behind you then you can really be an asshole. So it becomes exaggerated. Yeah. When and why did you start this theory or come up with this theory? Just observation. You know, just seeing, I mean, here's Tom Hanks, who is as nice as he could be, and he's, you know, one of the biggest stars in America, but he's a really good guy. Right, that's so interesting. And then who else besides Sybil Shepherd would be on that other end of the spectrum? Um, I'd, I'd have to give it some thought, but you know, there, there are actors who, uh, there's the life's too short <laughs> factor that you just say, yeah, Val Kilmer is supposed to be uh, notorious. 
Um, there's a few others. A couple of things. Let me let me end with. You have such an inside view on television, and most of the people who are listening to Really Famous, it is a passion of theirs. So. What are some little inside secrets? I know it's hard to think of. That's a big, broad question. But like, what are some things that surprise others when you bring them up who aren't in television? Well, here's what always surprises me is how people, how the audience will confuse a character on television with the actual person. And I've had actor friends who play villains and... And people will bitch at them and stuff. It was really funny. Uh, I'm friends with this actor, Kurtwood Smith, and he plays villains in a lot of things. He's really a great actor. And he was also, he was the father on the 70s show. He also oh, okay, does comedy, okay? Yeah, okay? Yeah. And he was in one of our series. So I, I knew him. And we were at a spring training game together. And at the time, Kurtwood was on 24. And he was an evil senator on 24. And he and I go up to the concession stand. And there's people giving him shit. Well, what are you doing to Jack Bauer, man? Oh, you know, you're an asshole, man. It's like, he's playing yeah. a character. He's an actor. Um I've had a lot of actors tell me that too. I think that is very common. People blur the lines, but when we I get letters to the characters, okay, they'll send a letter to Cheers will be sent to Diane Chambers, okay, <laughs> and they will so write funny. to Diane <laughs> as <laughs> as if that's that's really Shelley. I think you and Sam should get together and why did you, you know, and they'll write to Carla Tortelli and why are you so mean to Diane all the time? How is she, um, Rhea Perlman? Oh, she is so unlike Carla Tortelli. <laughs> she's very sweet. She's married to Danny DeVito. Right. She's very quiet. And do you, you know? see By the way, she's not this firebrand Italian she's this kind of mousy Jewish girl do you hang out with anybody who you worked with any of these actors you mentioned still to this day or is everybody just kind of shuffle along in their lives uh, I have lunch with Shelley I see George from time oh, to George time Lent. Norm Norm I hang out with uh, you know from time to time I see Ted I see Nancy from time to time um, I you know happy to say and maybe it's because a I'm a director myself or B the fact that I just like actors that I'm happy to say that I have a really good relationship with all the actors that I've worked with and that's have, great. That have, says something about directed. you. It's it's nice. I enjoy their company. I know there's some writers who hate actors and you know, they're they're just out to screw my lines and make my life miserable and that kind of thing and you know, actors who are suspicious of of writers, but I I enjoy their company. And the other thing that you learn working with actors of that caliber is how good they are, how skilled they are. And, and I admire their dedication, and I, writers are gonna kill me for saying this, but the way they live through their characters, oftentimes if they'll go, I, I don't think my character would say this, um, they're usually right, you know? And, and I think I've become a better writer by being a director and really getting to see and learn the actor's uh, process because in most cases, they are right. That was Ken Levine. I'm Kara Mayer-Robinson. Thanks for listening to Really Famous. 